Let's talk about Surrogate, a 2022 Australian paranormal horror movie. And it's a bit of a head spinner, so we've been joined for some help by the producer, director, and co-writer of the movie. All the way from Oz, it's Mr. David Willing. How are you, sir? I am excellent. Thank you very much for having me. And how are you guys? Great. Yeah. Great to have you here. Really looking forward to this one, mate. The first proper filmmaker we've ever had on the channel. <laughs> proper filmmaker. <laughs> the honour is yours, Dave. <laughs> and forever will be. Thank you. So, Surrogate, we're going to do this review in two halves. We're going to do a half, which is a non-spoiler review for those who would like to hear what we think and then go and check the movie out. But then we'll tail into the back half doing some spoiler type stuff. So, David, if you could provide a synopsis of what Surrogate is all about. Surrogate, it's the story of Natalie Paxton, who's a single mother and a nurse, and she falls mysteriously ill. And the doctors aren't sure exactly what's happened to her. But suddenly all of these violent paranormal incidences start happening to her and her daughter. And ultimately she has to fight to save her family from being ripped apart. There we go. When it comes to the, the mother in question here, uh, Natalie, played by Kessie Marassi, who some people may recognize from being in Wolf Creek mm. some years ago. What was it like working with Kesty? Cause she puts it in a good performance brilliant, in this film. Absolutely brilliant performance. Yeah, Kesty, yeah, she was incredible in the film. and. She she actually said Surrogate was a more intense and difficult film to shoot than Wolf Creek because essentially mm. she's in almost every scene of the film. Mm. We had a long rehearsal period and a lot of that was discussing the screenplay and we talked a lot about her character and the progression her character goes through in the story. Mm -hmm. We rehearsed the film for about two weeks beforehand, assembled a really good cast and each day I would just bring in different actors for her to work with across the film. When we got on set, she just threw herself very full on into the role and yeah, it's a pretty special performance. How long was filming? David? It was actually, we only shot, had 19 days to shoot the film. Wow. It's a crazy schedule. What we had because of people's timelines, ultimately it was probably a 25 day schedule. We just ended up doing some very long days. We actually had 18 days, then we had to do a pickup day. Just we ran out of time on some scenes. And then about four months after we went back for another half day just to do a few little shots. But yeah, that's what mm -hmm. the, the schedule was crazy. You know, sometimes it was sort of three hours sleep and then get back on set. So. Oh, that's insanity. <laughs> In terms of the film itself we'll, we'll do some non-spoilery sort of like little juicy bits here and there. Mm. This is a film that reveals its plot in quite a nice way that slowly unravels these mystery elements. It's quite a heavy movie in sort of the family department and there's a lot of personal feelings attached to that. That being said, would you consider the film to be categorised as like a horror film first or kind of more of like a mystery type movie but with horror elements included? Yeah, that's an interesting perspective because when I'd sort of envisaged the project with uh, Beth King who I co-wrote it with we very much wanted to make it, you know, a good piece of storytelling with the horror aspects in it so films like Exorcist we're really big fans of mm. the others with Nicole Kidman oh great film <laughs> yeah. such a great and, film um, have you guys seen um, The Orphanage a Spanish paranormal horror oh not for quite some time I haven't no oh that's worth checking out as well but those films you know they're good filmmaking with mm -hmm. those horror elements in there so the balance was is how we keep the scares and the horror component up but let's say something like Exorcist, you know, it spends time with the characters and what those story yes. arcs are. And I mean, I love really schlocky. I love all sorts of horror films. <laughs> yeah, um, of course. <laughs> uh, you know, and I love the schlockiest, cheapest style, but I'm also, <laughs> you know, horror is not my main genre. I love cinema and, uh, and old school cinema. So, you know, we want to focus on that storytelling and the performance aspects. But it was interesting because when we would watch it in the cinema with audiences, you could really feel that that horror felt quite intense at times. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that we, we did notice was was nursery rhymes um, yeah. in this film. So Two Little Ducks is uh, sort of the central uh, nursery rhyme that, that's used in a lot of the different scenes. I was just wondering if you could clarify sort of what the purpose is of choosing that particular nursery rhyme. Yeah, a few people had contacted us and said, oh, you've now ruined this for my child. <laughs> they, they used to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, th th it's always fun in horror. I mean, anything that's sort of saccharine that you could subvert. And we actually, in different drafts, we had some different songs and versions and it tied into this idea of mothers and children so mother ducks and, and ducklings and going away and you know in the nursery rhyme they come back but perhaps not so much in surrogate <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I guess before we jump into talking more in depth about the movie this is a movie that I think people will appreciate if you like stuff like Dave's already mentioned like the others I think there's a kind of whether it's intentional or not a little bit of a Jennifer Kent feel to this film sort of like a 
Babadook type story where it focuses quite a lot on the family unit side of the story quite in first and foremost but then attaches horror elements to it becoming quite a character led film so if you like those kind of uh, movies then this one definitely is worth checking out it's available at the moment in various parts of the world so for the UK it can be accessed on uh, Amazon Prime the US and Australia New Zealand and Canada it's on uh, Amazon and Tubi TV and Google Play and we're hoping it'll roll out on some more platforms over the next few months brilliant there we go so if that one intrigues you then definitely go and check it out and then come back to this video because we're going to talk more <laughs> about what you've just seen <laughs> it's, it's like you've never left right so now let's talk about it this film was bollocks no I'm <laughs> 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 right, let's get into it. So, we have Natalie, of course, who is the mother to Rose. Natalie one night goes out and sees a very strange woman seemingly talking to an invisible entity. Uh, and this woman's name is Margot Malloy. However, Margot decides to strangely kill herself in front of Natalie in a very bizarre moment. But Natalie starts to feel stomach cramps. And what happens next is a very, very cool and I even turned to Hugh and went this is a bloody original idea I've never mm. really seen a lot of stuff like this Dave what happens to Natalie? When in hospital the doctors say to Natalie that she was pregnant and she insists that that is impossible but then they tell her that all physical indicators show that she was not only pregnant that she went full term and gave birth to a baby but this baby is nowhere to be found the scene itself which Renee who was our makeup artist she termed it the blood rush it's quite a moment that scene and so Someone in the world premiere actually during that scene couldn't handle it, got up and actually passed out. Ah, pussy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, bill, the bill different in the UK, Dave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've seen this waiting for the bus on a Sunday yeah. morning. <laughs> no, I agree. Like, me, me and Hugh turn to each other at the moment that Natalie sort of like, because the, the blood exits her. Very well handled, I think, in that makeup department. Sound as well, isn't it? It just thuds on the floor as well. See, Renee, who did that? effect I said to her we were shooting it at about 3 30 in the morning and I said we'll either get this in take one or take 80 but the problem is, is we only had three white nighties that Kesty was wearing so <laughs> <laughs> oh, was what, what was it shut? Was it the store? Like to get some more? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, nothing is open at that hour. And but it worked in take one. And I think Kirsty's physical performance is great. Ben's cinematography and Bianca, the production designer, it was it was all just working at that time. It was great. And from here on out, we just embark on this sort of very mysterious quest with you know multiple people, sort of like trying to piece together this puzzle as to what exactly has happened to Natalie, the child actor who plays. Lisa, as well as the other child actors, especially the, the girl who plays Ava and the girl who plays Rose, I think across the board, really solid child acting. Yeah, I mean, on the first day of auditioning, I texted Beth and I just said, how do we end up with three nine-year-old actors <laughs> in the film? Because I hadn't worked with children and we saw every, almost every child actor in Melbourne and yeah, I was pretty happy with the little stars that we, we unearthed for the film and, and they were great to work with. I said I hadn't worked with children before, but I really enjoyed working with them and Ellie, who plays Lisa Bayer, she actually came in on the first day of auditions and she auditioned for the three roles. That's just greedy. That's just greedy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we gave her that role because she understood the irony of being this little girl who does horrible things, but she feigns innocence. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Ava there. To be honest, I think the actress who, who played Ava was fantastic as well and probably delivered my favourite scene of the film. So when they're communicating to the other side, the idea of the left mirror being benevolent, the right mirror being evil. I've personally never seen that done before in the way that the camera pans from from one side to the other you just almost yeah. anticipate aren't you that jump scare which doesn't really come in the form that you're expecting it in the mirror absolutely fantastic i love that scene yeah thank you we the screenplay when we started sending it around pretty much everyone who read it they were like wow this seance scene's incredible yeah the use of these mirrors and how we're communicating with the other realm yeah, it was something we hadn't seen before it was built off an internet sensation called the three kings but it played out very differently we reworked the whole idea what was great 
watching that with audiences is as the camera pans across, you know, you could mm-hmm. see the audience. That's when they were starting to sort of slide into their seat or cow because they're waiting for this hit to come. And and as you guys, I mean, you, you're horror experts and you know that jump scares get really overused these days. Yes, and, yeah. and it's something in the film we didn't want to do. We knew there'd be a few jump scares because every horror film has that. But Mark Byers, our music composer, we, we both agreed that we don't want these just every few minutes a loud music sting and a jump scare. And in that scene, it's yeah. Yeah, the audience is wondering where is it going to where is it yeah. going to come from yeah I think as like horror enthusiasts you, you almost develop a metronome for jump scares sort of through <laughs> yeah. the years as you, you watch hundreds and hundreds more horror films and when something sort of throws you off that metronome and the jump scare either does or doesn't come when you're expecting it to that's when you get sort of the most satisfaction out of a scene I think this definitely threw us off looked at each other and thought you know that was a really well crafted scene you spot on it doesn't play exactly how you expect it. Now speaking of uh, you know some of the child actors and some of the adult actors of course who we've given some credit to myself and Hugh have a personal little running heartfelt gag that we have regarding a certain cat. How many cats auditioned for the role of Tinker? (laughs) 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 We the the Tinker was interesting I mean yeah not only did they say don't work with children they said you know don't work with animals and we had a dog and a cat as well as three child actors and um, Tinker actually Actually, was um, the only cat, and it was um, <laughs> to pass with flying colours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's in such demand. He's in demand around Hollywood at the minute. And what a great name for a cat as well. Like we, we always like me and Hugh are always like, what would be a great name for a cat? And Hugh, you would you like to provide our favourite name for a cat? Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> Next film, Dave. Next film, there's going to be a Duncan the cat. <laughs> I want credit in for that as well. So the mystery, it all really starts from Jane Beer, the mother of Lisa, who we talked about earlier in the review. But she's also got a son, Liam. When it comes to Lisa, there's kind of some dialogue from Natalie uh, to Rose, which kind of hints towards her feeling like she was a little bit perhaps neglected, perhaps that Jane wasn't the mother that she really wanted. And so we get the really bleak concept of Lisa drowning Liam in the bath my god Dave what possessed you (laughs) (laughs) but then it gets even more bleak Jane drags her to the forest and luckily this is only in dialogue of course Mm, yeah Mm. proceeds to stab Lisa so in terms of the intensity of the character stuff it gets bleak and full on but I like that revelation playing out of what actually happened with the Bayer family and each time Mm. we go Mm. back to that story we learn a different perspective on what it is and even when Natalie thinks she's nutted it out sort of three quarters of the way through the story it then changes again Mm -hmm. and I I don't know to me that's that's kind of fun (laughs) it's intense but you know you spend a lot of time with these characters I mean we I've been on the film for for six and a half years so we're writing it for Mm -hmm. two years directing and then editing and I mean I've I've watched scenes over 300 times through the process and I actually sort of think Lisa Bay is just this misunderstood creative genius now (laughs) Mm, yeah (laughs) <laughs> Much like yourself, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Minus the bath drowning, yeah. <laughs> so after Jane stabs her daughter Lisa, it doesn't just stop there for her, does it? So Lisa then crawls underneath an abandoned house, and that's where we, we learn that she dies, as in one of the scenes she points at a dead body. Margot Molloy then moves into that house. Lisa possesses Margot and causes a phantom birth, just like Natalie's. I mean, the scene where she then kills herself with, I think, peroxide chemicals. Nee, that was so graphic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that really set the tone for the film didn't it yeah we actually that scene we shot on the very last night of production uh, and we actually had to go back and that was one of the ones we had to go back and do a few extra shots of yeah we had the idea that she's drinking Drano or something mm. and writing it it changed quite a lot from earlier drafts the, the difference between draft one and four mm. was really significant and she killed herself in a different way mm. uh, in the first draft when we came up with this idea of sort of just drinking Drano or mm. something from a, a petrol station we're like oh that's that's brutal but brilliant yeah, um. yeah. <laughs> and it was it was both of those things that's for certain and it's just that really cool concept of what the surrogate title reflects it's that essentially from our interpretation that Lisa you know wasn't happy with how she was being treated by her mother so after she's been killed the ghost of Lisa wants to get a surrogate mother by possessing them yeah and back on that thing with Lisa what is interesting is where you know what's her backstory and what one of the things we were playing around with is the impact that she had
has on everyone she crosses paths with. So I was actually just doing the director's commentary for the Blu-ray release, which is coming out shortly. Nice. Um, and one of these things that people, when they came back to watch it a second time around, were picking up on is that Lisa Age is everybody that she's involved in. So when we see her mum, Jan- Janet. Sorry, I know what you mean. Yeah, that's clever. <laughs> <laughs> the penny drop. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but again, it's the, there is a lot going on. When you were, you know, watching it, to me, it reminded me of the experience I had when um, I saw Seven when that first mm, first came yeah, out. Yeah, in terms yeah. of, it was a film that I kind of go the first time around. I, I got all of the sweep of it, mm. but I couldn't explain every detail because there's so much going on. But then when you go back later, it's all there. And so one of these things with when there's the news report about Lisa missing, and we see a photo of Lisa, Liam, and Janet. You know, her mum looks much younger, but it's only sort of a year beforehand. Mm. Um, and then when we actually meet her in real life, she's aged and Margot's aged and, and Natalie and you know it's really what I like about just she enjoys wreaking havoc on people and messing with them mm, that's clever and if, even you saying that my mind immediately jumped to when you know Natalie goes to see Margot's body and guesses the age and the age is a decade apart that little detail there makes it a more rich experience I think the way that yourself and Beth have certainly put this film together is, is extremely impressive yeah I mean it's always fun when you go back and you do pick up on, mm. on those different details Details. The audience, you want to be caught up in the experience rather than being able to spot all those things. So with the screenings, we were at all the, the screenings in Melbourne. We'd do Q&As and, you know, meeting people afterwards. We'd have cast members along and different people would pick up on these little different details mm. like what's happening on the, the fridge in the kitchen, for example. Yes, yeah, yeah. with the fridge magnets, yeah. yeah. But that detail, yeah, we, we did spend a lot of time going, you know, how do you plan all those that will add more to the story? But if, if you're not seeing them initially, like a, a small thing, which I'll say now, which I haven't said anywhere else, except for the director's commentary which oh, has Oh, we got been an exclusive, boys. Ex- <laughs> <laughs> exclusive for the Ghoul Gang. Yeah. Um, was because we're very much influenced by Asian horror cinema and Asian cinema in general I, I really love uh, across all their genres. But when Natalie goes to the house out in the woods, to Mad Margot's house, that letterbox that's on the post, we, we'll put a letterbox here but put number four on it. And the relevance of four in a lot of Asian cultures, that's the equivalent of 13. It's an unlucky number. Ah, um, that's good. It hasn't hit the Asian markets yet, but I know that's something that a lot of their audiences will pick up on. Um, and, and it's ah, just, it's, yeah. it, it's fun putting that detail in. I mean, the fun bit is, is when people come up with different theories on different aspects, mm. you know, even yes. the last scene uh, in particular, people have had some different takes on, which is all really, you know, exciting and, and interesting. There's a great line that Beth wrote when they're doing the video diary early on, when Rose is doing her school assignment, the video diary of the family tree. And it was Beth's idea to put this line in saying, you know, I don't have any brothers or sisters but it's great because I don't have to share my mum with anyone else um, mm. and second time around that's the quality of that writing from Beth really shows when you know the trajectory of the story oh, so you can tell the bits that she wrote <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid. Um, For sure. I suppose then, actually, uh, we, we've covered quite a lot of ground there. And of course, there's, there's a whole bunch of mystery boxes in the movie that we, we still haven't discussed. But this is still classified as an honest review. I imagine, Dave, that you're probably a fan of the film. I, I don't know if, you know, <laughs> writing it, producing it and directing it is something to do with that. So myself and Hugh will share our final thoughts of the film. For sure. For myself, I think it was a really refreshing watch. In a horror world where so many ideas are done to death or it's a lot of copy and paste type stuff. I think that what this film provided was a concept that, you know, even people who've been watching horror movies for many years can find something original in there, as well as just being like a really solidly acted film, not just with Kesty and the child actors that we've mentioned before, but with Jane Badler as well, who plays Lauren, the investigator, who's looking into this, you know, mystery between Janet and between Natalie. She's someone who is really easy to hate in the best way possible. It's that like Joffrey Baratheon complex where you just despise every scene you're in because they act it so well. I think she played that role phenomenally and the film in general has just got a really good screenplay. You know, the sound design is very good. Yeah, it was a pleasure to watch and and thank you for getting in touch with the channel to discuss it. Yeah, I have to agree with that as well. I really, really enjoy this, David. Honestly, some really original ideas in there. My favourite scene being the mirror scene as well. I've never seen that done before. The tension build up, it was just gripping. I think we had a really, really good time watching this together, didn't we, Connor? We certainly did. And now we've been uh, very positive about you. We'll let you send that $100 over PayPal. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, you, you do realise that 100 Aussie dollars is probably only about 35 pounds. Yes, <laughs> man, that's the way the country's going at the moment. That's like a Freddo or like, you know, like a caramel or something, you know? <laughs> but anyway, there we go. That was our honest review of 2022's surrogate. David Willing, thank you very much for joining us in this episode. Thank you very much for having me, guys. This has been a lot of fun and uh, thanks for your kind words on the film as well. Really appreciate that. So if you would like to uh, support Dave in any of his other projects, check his IMDb page to see some of the productions he's been a part of. And if you would like to, of course, do something more important than that, which is subscribe to our channel. Then, <laughs> <laughs> then please uh, hit the, the button down below and uh, hopefully we can get uh, you know some more people from within the industry on the channel in future. But of course, the golden medal to the first ever filmmaker on the channel is held by Mr. David Willen. Thank yes. you, sir. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Cheers. <laughs> awesome.